what the hell is cottagecore? Cottagecore is what's referred to as an internet aesthetic, a visual heavy concept that's grouped around a consistent theme, repeated imagery, and a particular colour palette, and might show up in things like fashion choices, Tumblr photo sets, Pinterest boards, or even offline activities and pastimes which are then recorded and displayed back online. In terms of cottagecore, think thatch roof cottages, herb and flower gardens, reading poetry, embroidering and crafting, baking and picnics, flower pressing, sun-dappled woodland walks, animals like deer, hares, foxes, and pheasants. In terms of inspiration from art, literature, and the media, you're looking at things like The Moomins, Winnie the Pooh, Anne of Green Gables, Peter Rabbit, The Hobbit, The Great British Bake Off, and yes, even Animal Crossing. Take those, mash them together, and you have a pretty good approximation of cottagecore. Oh, and a lot of it is also very, very gay. If we look at it from a purely visual level, then we can see how it might be seen as dainty, delicate, and feminine. But cottagecore also has within it the implications of surplus time, of a lack of digital technology, of an ease and slowness, and a lack of urgency and oftentimes those things are its appeal. It often focuses on low stakes activities, so crafting rather than fine art for example, something which has a functional use versus something that you've often been told you can be just naturally good at, and if you're not, kind of feels like you might be failing at the top. A quote from a New York Times article on Cottagecore explains, There's not a lot of stuff you can do to make mistakes. I mean, it's just going out in the woods and finding mushrooms and berries or sitting down and reading a book outside. But like a lot of content on the internet, there is an element of perfectionism within Cottagecore. An effortlessness. If you look at Cottagecore baking posts, they almost never go wrong. They're never going to be burnt or crumbled. And there are of course a lot of ways in which going into the woods and picking mushrooms and berries to eat could quite literally be fatal. But the internet research and googling that would go into making sure that you knew where to forage, what those things look like, and how to safely identify them, is not really shown within cottagecore content. Only the activity itself is if the knowledge was just naturally imparted to you. There are also sort of sub-genres of cottagecore, as well as other aesthetics and movements that kind of brush up alongside it. I think, by now, most people know the connotational difference between the phrase cabin in the woods and the phrase woodland cottage, even though they're technically synonyms. Of course, knowing this difference didn't stop my naive ass from saying yes when my cottagecore girlfriend of two years invited me for a cabin getaway with her. In my defence, when she said it was an old family home, I assumed she meant a quaint old cottage of her grandmother's and not the murder house her family had been using for decades. Dark or goth cottage core has more kind of Halloween vibes and more autumnal settings. The focus on natural elements and components in modern witch movements like Wicca mean that paganism and witch talk is an obvious companion to cottagecore. Morikai, a style of Japanese street fashion that emphasises things like comfortable clothes, layers of natural fabrics and earthy forest colours, can absolutely be seen as a precursor to cottagecore. And I for one know that I would be in full support of six scenes in a movie of like a cottagecore lesbian and a dark academia bisexual living together in a cute cottage together, maybe they solve crimes, maybe they do magic, maybe they just uh, be gay, I'd be very into that. Because of its place on the internet, cottagecore could just as easily be referred to as hashtag cottagecore. It is so intrinsically tied to the mediums that it runs across, namely Tumblr, TikTok, and Instagram. The nature of these particular online mediums means that your engagement with cottagecore is much more likely to be visual than experiential. The full cottagecore experience is only really available to a very limited amount of people who have access to a countryside setting, a beautiful cottage, long flowing day dresses. Following, watching, curating, or reblogging cottagecore content, however, is a way of engaging with that content in a way that is accessible even in an urban bedroom within lockdown. And small elements of cottagecore can be experienced regardless of location, baking from scratch, for example, simple crafting, incorporating some element of cottagecore fashion into your own looks. are most often are not welcomed. They are supported within a cottagecore online community rather than being seeing as lacking because you aren't doing enough. 
there's a kind of lack of gatekeeping there. It's also important to note that its use as a hashtag has a sort of functionality on these websites in order for people to be able to find similar content. I use hashtag cottagecore within my baking TikToks, for example, because I know that it's a kind of content that someone searching the cottagecore hashtag will want to see. I've called myself a cottagecore lesbian in the videos of me like harvesting gooseberries or making elderflower cordial, not because I identify as a cottagecore lesbian, but because it makes sense the aesthetic of that video is a cottagecore aesthetic. A lot of us might already have elements of cottagecore in our own lives. I looked around my room earlier. I have some pieces of art with like cute woodland animals on. I have a few uh, wooden boxes and various trinkets that could absolutely make their home inside of a cottage. I also have an absolute ton of cookbooks. There are, there's so many of them all over this house. And I, like many people, had and did these things before cottage core was a phrase that anyone was using, let alone one that I had heard of. So to find its origins and its appeal, especially to queer people, we're gonna have to look back in time. Where did cottagecore come from? The idea of cottagecore is much older than the hashtag. In fact, it's much older than the internet itself. This impulse to strip back, to return to nature, is one that we've seen throughout history. In a more gauche example from the 18th century, French nobles like Marie Antoinette would create purpose-built villages and farms on their land to act as rustic retreats, where they could visit to dress as milkmaids and engage in a sort of performance of rustic life. Pastoral appreciation can also be seen in artistic countercultural movements, especially when we start having more rapid advancement of technology. The arts and crafts movement, including the work of William Morris, had a very different implication than Marie Antoinette's fake villages, with an attitude that criticised the division of labour, capitalism, and the loss of traditional crafts movements. Romanticism similarly rebelled against the Industrial Revolution and a rapidly encroaching modernity, with an emphasis on the emotional individual and a glorification of both the past and nature. The concept of youth subculture cultures is similarly not new. In fact, the heyday of countercultural movements is in the second half of the 20th century, a time that was sandwiched between eras when the general population had little to no ability to communicate their ideas on a national level, and our current digital age where everyone is able to communicate anything they think all of the time. Rising literacy rates, the creation of the concept of the teenager, as well as rapid social change that alienated young people from their parents' generations, was a perfect environment for countercultures to thrive. The final ingredient to this was a growing number of liberation movements, including LGBTQ plus liberation, and a more foregrounded fight for equality across marginalised identities. Youth subcultures, from hippies and punks to the queer ballroom scene, were formed as a kind of counterculture to the mainstream. This was latched onto by teens who had little ability to gain a voice within the mainstream that was curated by adult professionals who decided what was being published and when. And these were not simply random opposition, they often had a kind of uniform, set language, and ideas and values behind them. These ideas often came from a small number of voices of authority within a subculture, oftentimes a musician or a number of bands or an underground magazine or publication or something similar. These limited amount of sources, especially in comparison to the open communication that we currently have on the internet, kind of created a monopoly of influential tastemakers within different subcultures. And so we see how this environment in the 20th century completely shifts when it comes to the digital age. It means a fundamental change in the way we experience groups and subcultures. One youth report in 2017 explaining that nowadays, lifestyles are flexible, not fixed. Individuals are no longer defined by a single tribe, they exist and belong within multiple subcultures. Tastes, interests and interactions are no longer secured to a single scene or locality, they move fluidly across cities, cultures and communities. To be clear, I'm not saying that there aren't online subcultures. Furries, for example, very well known. And even in a global online world, ongoing inequalities can inform geographically focused subcultures like London's grime scene. But aesthetics like cottagecore, as opposed to subcultures, are a little different. The answers to questions like, how did they start? Who are the gatekeepers? How are the rules established? Where are the lines drawn? Are different to fully formed subcultures. Aesthetics are not tied fundamentally to a particular set of ideas or politics like a lot of countercultures. They are a visual manifestation of an idea onto which people can project their own meaning. The nature of the internet, and particularly the places in which we find aesthetics like Tumblr and TikTok, means tracking the origins of these aesthetics is near impossible. If, for example, a Tumblr user changes their username, any URL that you used to have of their blog is useless and if you know their new username, it ceases to be a link that works. And the search function on TikTok and Tumblr, let's just say it leaves a lot to be desired. So trying to find the first mentions of Cottagecore will be tough. Trying to then track that in any kind of logical way to see how it is spread would be even harder. 
But even if we could do that, wouldn't it just be looking at the first time a particular word had been mentioned for an aesthetical look that has ultimately existed for much longer? Different users across platforms have written cottagecore meta, essays, ideas lists, manifestos even. But none of them can truly be seen as central tenets of the aesthetic as a whole because the reach of those individuals is so much smaller than the reach of the aesthetic in general. The answers to questions like how do they start, who are the gatekeepers, how are the rules established, where are the lines drawn in regards to cottagecore is, well, it depends. So why is cottagecore so appealing to the gays? Cottagecore is, at its heart, a form of gentle escapism. For queer and sapphic women, it allows them to imagine a space without homophobia, fear, and judgment that doesn't feel like a banishment, but instead a specifically curated paradise. It's a world of independence, of being able to live happily and peacefully with your partner, and a world that isn't revolving around men. For many, cottagecore is experienced as a powerful articulation of a world without heteronormativity and patriarchy. A recent New York Times article on cottagecore positioned self-care and escapism as two different and opposing forces. While cottagecore could easily be mistaken for an escapist fantasy, its proponents insist it's a form of self-care. But I don't think that these two things are mutually exclusive. For marginalised people, the world itself can often feel directly at odds with a peaceful and equal existence. History, the news, even walking down the street can give us a sense of fear and danger. And so escapism from that can absolutely be a form of self-care. It doesn't mean that you're turning your back on an unjust reality or claiming that there isn't more work to be done. You can protest, march, educate and fight, but you can also find something that brings you joy and solace, especially something that allows you to imagine a life where those things aren't necessary. My perspective is as a queer woman, but you can see this impulse across a lot of different marginalised identities in their participation in cottage call. Into a daybreak miraculously clear, I rise, bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave. Another often cited appeal of cottagecore is a sense of nostalgia. And I think on the surface, that's true, but it is specifically a sense of nostalgia for something that most people who participate in cottagecore have never actually experienced themselves. It's not a yearning to return to their own childhoods, but a yearning for an experience that is totally beyond the Gen Z and even young millennial childhood experiences at all. Most people participating in cottagecore will never have lived in a countryside cottage or cultivated a herb garden or lived without technology. In fact, they often have a life experience diametrically opposed to this. In this way, it feels closer to one meaning of the Welsh word hirai, which can be used by Welsh people to describe their admiration for the beauty of the landscape of their country country or the nostalgia for the way their country used to be, or at least the way it is depicted in stories of how it once was, a home that you cannot return to, no longer exists, or maybe never was. For most queer people, cottagecore is not based on a misremembered or romanticised past reality, but in a combination of fictional fantasies, from books, movies, games, or even Tumblr mood boards. I say for most queer people, and not all, because there is an interesting subsection of people who did grow up in rural towns and whose childhoods did brush up alongside this aesthetic. The reality of their past are not mapped perfectly on top of cottagecore, in large part because of their queer identities. I've seen within cottagecore a deliberate rewriting of those experiences in the past where they often felt a kind of fear or isolation within these rural settings. Cottagecore then becomes an exercise in imagining a return to those places and a reclaiming them as their own. Reed, a 27 year old who was interviewed for a Vice article on cottagecore articulated this beautifully. Even now when I go back, I can't help but feel watched and judged all the time for how I look or dress. It especially makes me feel like the things I loved in childhood, like having farm animals and picking blackberries in the fields and getting lost in the woods are cis and hetero coded. So for me, cottagecore is an ideal where I can be visibly queer in rural spaces. It also allows for a framing and expression of femininity outside of its supposed inferiority to masculinity. In cottagecore, what is seen as feminine is respected and powerful. A sense of gentleness doesn't make you weak. A sense of empathy and a lack of competitiveness is encouraged in order to create a communal environment. By removing itself from a world filled with the male gaze, Kotchishka also separates itself from a form of external sexualization that so many women, especially queer women, go through every day. But it also doesn't swing this around the opposite way to infantilize them, instead emphasizing a sense of agency and self-sufficiently that extends to identity and presentation. In cottage core, you can define your own time, your own identity, ultimately your own life. And the nebulous kind of definitions and interpretations of cottage core only add to that. But why now? 
Obviously an interest in escapism is nothing new, but I do think the appearance of a global pandemic has probably increased its interest in recent months. According to website fashionjournal.com, the hashtag cottagecore has over 212 million views on TikTok, and there's been a 541% spike in likes of cottagecore content on Tumblr since the start of coronavirus. COVID-19 has left most of us in some state of isolation or lockdown, and the fact that this is such a global problem means that for a lot of us it is difficult to imagine a time in which things will be back to normal everywhere. Cottagecore allows us to imagine a version of lockdown life in which we have access to nature, um, we have the ability to grow and make our own food rather than being reliant on going into spaces that might put us in danger, and also where a cosy indoor kind of environment is not something that is inherently linked to unemployment and loneliness and financial panic. Being stuck inside and only allowed out once a day for daily exercise or a walk, why not imagine a reality in which you can do that exercise or walk in a beautiful woodland rather than down a paved street in a city centre? Isolation by choice in a space that you've created yourself, not dependent on what a landlord says is allowed, is for a lot of people, a much more preferable idea. We've seen an element of this impetus in a much more mainstream way in the um, classic quarantine pastimes of baking banana bread and sourdough. Seemingly overnight, everyone was taking up this, quite frankly, lovely hobby, which was pretty low stakes and had a wonderful result at the end. Journalist Kristen Aiken has explained the appeal of this kind of hobby at a time like this, which I think matches perfectly onto cottagecore. It's a productive form of self-expression and communication, a form of mindfulness, a healthy distraction, and it also fits within a type of therapy known as behavioural activation. In all, baking can be a tremendous source of stress relief. So in that case, is cottagecore just a form of stress relief that brushes up alongside current issues but doesn't directly engage with them? Well, not necessarily. Is cottagecore political? As I mentioned earlier, the nature of cottagecore being an aesthetic rather than a sub or counterculture means that it doesn't have a centralised political ethos. But that doesn't mean that people can't experience cottagecore as an extension of their own political beliefs. Or that pockets of cottagecore can't specifically design and create their own political versions of the aesthetic. In fact, this has already happened across the political spectrum. And like, I mean across the political spectrum. The lack of a single unifying voice or manifesto means that it can be used, developed, memeified by anyone across the political spectrum that feels an affinity with the imagery. So let's look at three potential political readings of cottagecore that I have seen online already. 1. Anti-capitalism. This interpretation looks at the possibilities of cottagecore as a form of communal living outside of the pressures of commercialization and capitalism. As writer Shania Bryan explains, cottagecore turns its nose up at 16-hour workdays, at the fast-paced anxieties of late-stage capitalism, at toxic masculinity. The aim is not to be disconnected or isolated, but to find new forms of authentic connections that arise from shifted priorities. The cottage in the woods is not alone, but part of a healthy community built on a system that prioritises things other than the demand of the market. It's a form of aspirational aesthetic that isn't tied to wealth or designers or labels, but in fact pursuing a life completely outside of those sources of worth. But this reading does have its criticisms in reality. In England, for example, the kind of people who can afford to move out to the countryside to a picturesque cottage are those who are wealthy within a capitalist system already. Even if you and your friends scrimp and save and get enough money to have a queer commune in the woods, what of everyone else? What of the system that you're escaping? Individual success outside of the system does nothing to change the system itself. Ultimately, within an anti-capitalist reading, cottagecore can be seen as a potential idea to spur people on towards change, rather than a reality that's given to a privileged few. You might include examples of cottagecore fashion activities or ideas in your own life, while also pushing towards economic equality and justice. 2. Tradwives and the alt-right. According to the New York Times, hashtag tradwives are mostly white women who extol the virtues of staying at home, submitting to male leadership, and bearing lots of children. Although many who use the word to describe themselves on social media would say that they're just sharing their lives as housewives, in America especially the hashtag has been linked to white supremacy in the far right. Essentially celebrating the archaic angel in the house idea, a woman's place is at home and that their goal should always be to look after the men in their lives. There is an emphasis on returning to the past ideals of the 1950s or even earlier which, you know, as we all know, wasn't the best time for like 
queer people, people of colour, women in general. And Cottage Court on the surface can absolutely be seen as a fulfilment of those ideals, women in the home, baking, a sort of nostalgic haze. But specifically linking the aesthetics of a time and their values is not necessarily a part of cottagecore. For many, as we've seen, participation in cottagecore is more about escaping patriarchy and heterosexism rather than adhering to it. Similarly to Tradwives, if we look at specifically the idea of cottagecore prioritising celebrating nature, we can see why some people have warned of the possibility of it being co-opted by eco-fascism. A movement essentially described as disturbing link between nationalism and environmentalism. A twisted blend of authoritarianism, white supremacy, ethno national nationalism and a misguided concern for the care of planet Earth. Essentially people using environmental arguments to justify things like eugenics, a lack of migration and white supremacy. A self-identifying eco-fascist interviewed by the New Statesman explained, It's someone who has also turned away from industrial and urbanite society, seeking a more close to earth way of life. There are obvious links here to the Nazi idea of blood and soil and also the concept that people should go back to the homeland that they came from and also some dog whistle ideas about like urban people and their dangers. But right-wing extremism is not the only way that cottagecore can be viewed through an ecological lens. 3. Climate change and sustainability. It's worth noting that from what I've seen, eco-fascism is a kind of potential worry from people looking on at cottagecore rather than something that I've seen experienced within the aesthetic itself. More often than not, cottagecore is linked to a kind of climate crisis anxiety that I think a lot of people are feeling, and specific ways in which people might live more sustainable lives in order to make life better, not just just for the environment but also for collective humanity. There is often a focus on individual contributions when it comes to conversations around the environment. Things like going vegan or not flying long haul, and they think cottage court is an extension of this individual focus. Prepackaged food wrapped in plastic becomes homegrown and homemade lunches. Patterned beeswax wraps replace saran wrap, and clothes are hand sewn and knitted rather than off the fast fashion rack. Cottage court can be a way to empower young people to feel like they're doing their bit, however small, to reject the consumer focused world that contributed to the climate catastrophe that they were born into. What are the criticisms of cottage court? A lot of criticisms of cottagecore, I think, are based on the idea that people who are interested in the aesthetic truly believe that it depicts a complete reality. Cottagecore is at its heart escapism. It's not real, but it's also not really meant to be. Part of its whimsical appeal is the knowledge that it is a fantastical dream, a romanticised idea of cottage life that smooths out the rough edges and replaces English rain with dappled sunlight. Traditional work is not really part of the cottagecore aesthetic. You never see people having to commute within cottagecore. You never see people answering emails late at night or having to go to the local Tesco to work a shift. We know that the queer commune in the woods where deer walk into the garden and everyone is happy and we're baking pies together and we have an amazing library. The collection of books isn't real. But that's part of the appeal, that we are allowed to romanticise what a queer life might look like. That we can create this dreamy imagery around marginalised lives in a way that the mainstream almost never does. There have also been post-colonial criticisms of cottagecore, focusing around the potential implications of white people move into supposedly pure and untouched land, especially in America with its history of colonial occupation and manifest destiny. One Tumblr user, River Selkie, who, ironically enough, given my previous comments about how difficult it is to track people on Tumblr, has since deleted their blog, so I know nothing else about them other than this pretty lovely piece of writing around potential ways in which we could reconcile um, cottage core and a kind of awareness of colonialism. We can love nature and want to live in it without being apolitical, naive isolationists. Even an interest in nature that begins on the path of romanticism may lead to an authentic relationship with environmentalism and social justice, which are intrinsically linked. It is vitally important to become aware of land as more than its aesthetic beauty. We need to awaken to its political history, particularly here in America, where it has been stolen from indigenous peoples, commodified and homogenised. And I think that's a pretty fair idea if you're going to make cottagecore a large part of your online identity. Cottagecore has within itself the possibility to be an incredible educational gateway for people to learn about sustainable land practices, um, indigenous rights and agricultural methods like permaculture, as well as ways that these might be explored on a global scale. 
If you're interested in that, I'd highly recommend the documentary Land Cultures, Aboriginal Economies and Permaculture Features, which is on YouTube. Arguably, individualist cottagecore is a limited view of climate activism because it essentially prioritises small individual acts that can make you feel good but won't necessarily have any impact on a global or meaningful scale. This kind of individual focus can also often ignore the particular implications and complications of climate change for marginalised and low-income communities. How does living in a food desert affect your access to vegan or ethically sourced food? How is climate migration and displacement going to disproportionately affect people already struggling? How accessible or in this case, inaccessible are environmental alternatives to things like plastic straws that disabled people often need to be able to, you know, drink. But let's be clear, not everyone who's into cottagecore is doing so to engage in serious ideas. Escapism is, after all, often by its very nature, uncritical. A lot of people will escape into pieces of media that have a particular place because of memories of their childhood or of spending time with friends or family, and that media might not be saying anything or might have, you know, questionable 90s ethics. Basically, sometimes people just like the idea of baking bread for their queer cottage wife. And we can also see how images of marginalised people engaging in what we might consider to be a cottage core life can be powerful in and of themselves, carving out a space for themselves in imagery traditionally taken up by rich straight white people. Paula Sutton, or At Hill House Vintage, is a classic recent example. Her Instagram account, which features English country interiors, gardens, houses, life and vintage style, went viral after a white writer wrote on Twitter that she decided to leave Instagram, stating, I don't know when I'll be back, but let it be known that this was the image that did it, with one of Paula's pictures as the image in the tweet. Twitter, specifically led by Black Twitter, came out in cheering support for Paula when it happened, and criticising the writer for seemingly finding images of Black happiness and success objectionable. Some people have insisted that the original post was not meant as a racial criticism, but instead a criticism of a kind of curated Instagram perfection. But the distaste towards a joyful image of a Black woman minding her own business, not hurting anyone, and simply taking up space that is normally seen as belonging to white elite, shows a pretty clear lack of understanding at the very least. What is the future of cottagecore? Earlier in this video I pointed out that cottagecore is not a centralised subculture, but what that does mean is that it allows people to imagine their own futures for what cottagecore could potentially be. I personally would love to see the potential for a global future of cottagecore. When we strip it down to our basics and look at the fundamentals of cottagecore, we're looking at things like nature, like escapism, like baking, None of those things are specific to the idea of a kind of a Western thatched English cottage. A recent TikTok called for people of colour to show their interpretation of cottagecore in their own cultural dress, demonstrating the way this aesthetic, growing up on such a global app, has potential implications for its future. Another element I would love to see is visual sustainability within the aesthetic, the inclusion of solar panels or other forms of renewable energy, for example. A small sacrifice in the old-timey aesthetic element, which could help to support the ecological and political readings of it as an aesthetic I think could be really interesting. Similarly, explicitly accessible versions of cottagecore architecture. Old time cottages, at least in England, very unlikely to have like wide doorways, ramps, stair lifts, and including those to make it a more accessible aesthetic would be amazing. A pre-existing utopian leaning genre called solar punk explores ways technology can be used to support sustainability to help both humanity and the environment. I think fusing ideas of this alongside cottagecore could have amazing implications, not just for these fantastical, fictionalised, imagined worlds, but also the reality of architecture of the future. So I hope this video has answered the question of why cottagecore is so gay, and also a lot of other questions besides. If you would like to help support me make these videos in the future, then I will leave a link to my Patreon in the description, along with all my social media so you can find me all over the internet. In the comments, I would love to hear your thoughts on cottagecore, whether you agree with some of the criticisms, whether it's something that you participate in, and until I see you next time, bye.